everyone. I'm Jessica Hull, Australian 1500 meter, 3K and 5K record holder. I'm a Nike based runner, usually over in the US, but COVID has me at home in Australia for a while. And you're listening to the Physical Performance Show today. I've had my ups and my downs. Absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, Let's go. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Endure IQ and the Physical Performance Show's Learnings Membership. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. And of course, we do this across a range of different episodes, interest editions, coaches' corners, expert editions, and featured performers. And this week on episode 247, we keep the featured performer theme going. Last week, we heard from world champion triathlete 1991, now CEO of Triathlon Australia, Olympian Miles Stewart, sharing on his highs, lows and learnings. And we keep the Australian athlete theme going as well and get set today to enjoy the highs, lows and learnings of one of Australia's distance running rising stars, none other than Jessica Hull. Now, if you are a keen follower of Australian athletics, Jessica Hull needs no introduction. Earlier in 2020, Jessica went on a Australian record, national record, setting streak, kicking it off with a 5,000 metre new national record of 1443.80, the Diamond League in Monaco, followed one month later by the national record in the 1500 metres, 4 minutes, 042 set at the Diamond League in Berlin. And then just less than two weeks later, Jessica ran another Australian national record in the 3,000 metres in Doha, 836.03. Now, the 5,000 metre record was an 18-year record held by prior featured performer of the show, Benita Willis, episode 20. And Jess's 1,500 metre time has her poised to be potentially the first Australian woman to ever run sub four minutes in the coming years for the 1500 metres. Needless to say, Jessica is a huge talent. And on today's episode, you'll hear Jess share around the highs, lows and learnings, the origins of her athletic days, the role of her family and support team in helping Jess perform at a physical best, the influence of time spent on scholarship at the University of Oregon in the US, the role of strength and conditioning in Jess's performances, fueling for the work required, and Jess survives the physical performance round and issues a double header on the physical challenge for the week. Get your track shoes on. This is a ripper. Here is my conversation with Australian national record holder, the 1500 metres, 3000 metres, and 5000 metres, Jessica Hull. Jessica Hull, we've been uh, looking to sync this for some time. It's been a a, a chaotic period in the history of the earth uh, and a great year for yourself picking up three national records. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for having me on. I'm glad we could finally sit down and chat. Well, you've come off the back of, uh, we we theme this show, Jess, the highs, the lows and the learnings. And, And obviously, anyone in Australian distance running is very well versed in your accomplishments uh, this year, uh, three consecutive national records, uh, the 1,500 metres, 3,000 and 5,000 metres. Uh, but in, a, in the middle of all that, you've also been navigating travel arrangements through a worldwide pandemic, trying to get visas uh, to get back to the US, I believe, and trying to get back into your home country of Australia. So how, I mean, talk about the highs and some of the lows. Yeah, definitely a year of some big highs with that. Uh it pretty much started on a high with training and running um, in January, and I rode that high through till the very start of October. 
for racing. Um, but everything in between has been pretty challenging and I've definitely learned a lot. I don't think, I wouldn't say that there was necessarily a low um, in there because I'm surrounded by some pretty good people that always point out the positive in the situations for me. So um, I think the the most challenging part has been not being able to be based with my teammates and my coach directly this year. Um, since graduating at the University of Oregon mid last year, I've been working on my working visa. And I was at the point of being able to interview in March when I was coming home for the Australian Championships. Um, but by the time I landed back here in Australia, they'd actually closed the consulates. So I was here and I had the option I could, I can go back to the US on 90 day cycles, but currently you have to quarantine to come into Australia. So we just bit the bullet and we're like, okay, well, we'll, we'll deal with it this way and you'll stay at home and you'll train. And um, I've been able to get some work in under the guidance of my dad again and um, had some good young guys who are usually over in the NCAA home as well, who were so willing to help me in workouts um, and that uh, they definitely counteracted like the lows that could have amounted from all of that time, kind of having to work pretty solo and remotely from the people that I'm used to training with every day. And, and how far away would you envision, Jess, that it may be before you can be back with your squad in the US and your coach directly, Peter? I'm really hoping January. Um, at the moment, it looks like January because I have been able to book an appointment for the embassy. Um, but I've also been able to book an appointment four or five times prior as well. And they keep getting cancelled about a month or so out from that appointment. Um, so I'm just crossing my fingers, kind of, I guess next week might be the telltale is if I if I don't hear any word, um, then that could possibly mean that that January appointment is going to go ahead and I can plan on going back to the US right once I um, receive the visa back. So hopefully. Because, <laughs> I mean, your relationship uh, in researching for today, you've, you've got a, <laughs> a, a very great team around you, Pete, Pete your coach, uh, who uh, in listening to the Aussie Runner Pod podcast actually this morning <laughs> in the conversation you had with the gentleman, you used a phrase, you said, he's the man with a plan and I yeah. just turn up and do the job that I have to do, something along those lines. Yeah. It, it did make me smile uh, as I ran along. So is that something that, you know, how, how does that mindset come about where it's like, right, trust in Pete's process here to have me ready for what will ultimately be Tokyo 2021 uh, and, and I'll show up and, as you say, just do the job. Uh, yeah. How does that mindset come about? Is that something that you've worked on together or is that just you innately as a trust in athlete? Yeah, well, I'm glad I could keep you company on the run this morning. <laughs> <laughs> it did make the 10K go faster. <laughs> Good, I'm glad. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's just uh, it develops over time when you're working with a coach and I've been pretty lucky to have really good coaches all the way through that has kind of just taught me that um, I can put my trust in them and once you put your trust in the coach and everything like it just starts to make way more sense and you do everything with a bit more purpose. Um, so pretty much since day one, I've had that trust in Pete, um, even while we were developing our own relationship because I've seen the results that he's had with previous athletes and they speak for themselves, um, especially Shannon Rowberry. Uh, she, like, I hope to have a similar trajectory to her in that, like, I'm still running at the world level at 36 years of age. Um, I hope that that's me. So... I kind of see what he's done with Shannon and then what he was doing with Coco at the time. Um, and that just made me totally buy in. Um, and then just being around the same strength and conditioning coach that I'd had uh, a little bit of work with at Oregon. Um, he works with the college team as well. Uh, so that consistency and just his faith in Pete as well just totally took off. And um, as soon as I bought in, I started seeing results and I started being able to do things that I never thought I could do in workouts. And um once you get a taste, it's uh, pretty easy to keep going. <laughs> what uh, Can you give any examples specifically, Jess, of results that you saw in training where you were like, wow, I never conceived that was possible? Is there any track, any sessions, for example, that you banked in the lead up to what was the uh, consecutive national record running streak that you had a few months ago? Yeah, so this year I would say um, there was two sessions that I actually did back here in Australia they came through from Pete and I had some help from Scotty Hamilton. He's a, a young distance runner in the area who actually goes to Boston University, but he was home at the time. Um, and just kind of on paper, I was initially like, oh, wow, these are 
pretty quick splits. Um, but once I got going at both the, I did uh, a workout that was three sets of eight, six, four, two, and then a workout that was eight, eight hundreds. Um, and just like the comfort and also being able to trust Scotty in his pacing um, and just totally switch off behind him uh, made me be able to do splits that I like were faster than they were written on paper. And initially I was intimidated by the paper <laughs> splits. <laughs> eight, eight, eight hundreds. Uh, this sounds brutal. Uh, reading it. I mean, what, what sort of recovery were you having between the reps? Yeah. So recovery is pretty generous in our squad, um, at least so far for me. Um, I think <laughs> we've focused more on the intensity of the intervals. So it can be anywhere from like a, a set distance jog. So 500 jog, um, but it can be up to you how long that takes. So it might be three minutes after the first one, but by the time you're getting towards the end of the workout, it might be six, six and a half minutes kind of thing. Um, I try, I, I know based on talking to Shannon, um, that that's an area that is going to, I'm going to improve in a lot. Um, maybe the splits don't necessarily get a bit faster for a few years, but the fact that I'll be able to do them all off, a little bit less rest um, will also be like an improvement to putting together a good race on the track. So yeah, right now recovery is pretty generous. It's more about hitting the split. <laughs> and uh, and being ready to go. And you don't have to yeah. answer, but what split were you looking to hit across eight of those 800s? Um, well, we were just trying to average 3K pace. So at that point I was um, looking at about 68 for 3k so we started there and then I, I ran my last one in 209 um and that was kind of my confidence booster that I was uh if I can run 209 at the end of this workout I can go through in 208 209 very comfortably in a fast 1500 so yeah, yeah it was a good day <laughs> and uh and it did you know it painted the uh the way forwards to what were those fantastic performances Jess in uh, in Berlin and then Monaco I mean, taking uh, down Linden Halls, uh, four minutes, point zero zero point eight six, and you bettered that to four minutes in the 1,500 metres, zero zero point four two. So you took a whisker off that one. Uh, yeah, just that, a bit. <laughs> and, I mean, that one, from what I could gather, was the one that you really wanted. I mean, the others, the 3,000 and 5,000 were fantastic, but the 1,500 was pretty near and dear to your heart. Yeah, I think I've, I've always kind of considered myself a 1500 meter runner. So that's kind of the one that I've looked at for a long time. Um, even prior to when Lyndon broke it in 2018, I think uh, the magic that an Aussie woman hasn't been under four just yet is something that I've kind of looked at as like, well, I would love to be the first person to do that. Um, so yeah, I think that was a step toward that this year. But uh, there's three or four of us that can be gunning for that sub four still coming next year. Absolutely. And, uh, and as you say, you look at your training buddy there, Shannon, who's 36 years of age, still competing on the world stage and, and you have many, many seasons ahead of you. And yeah. that seems like something I've gleaned from my research that yourself and Peter as, as your coach are, are really, you know, particular around that's that you're an evolving athlete. There's no rush. Mm -hmm. It's no, you, your success is built on seasons, not a season. Yeah, that's, um, and that's like, I think it's very grounding to have Pete's sports like that um I know that everything that I do isn't going to be the best and I'm ever going to be able to do it because he's got such a long-term plan um and it keeps you it keeps you in the process kind of thing too like if some days are harder it's like well it doesn't matter if today was a bit rough um I'm going to do this workout for a number of years and it's going to get better each time it doesn't need to be perfect straight away um and I think that's where we've kind of like I know when I first went back to training with the team in January for camp in Phoenix, um, it's kind of like I, I came back in good shape, but it was like, and I'd had a really good workout, but I didn't really want the praise for it. I was like, it's January 2nd. Like we don't need to be having those kinds of workouts just yet. Like this is a starting point. Like we're not, we're not where we're going to get to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, your fellow Australian teammate, Ryan Gregson shared that way back on, episode 30 something where Ryan said that every session is just a building block in the yeah. bigger wall. And I often think of what, I think it was Bill Gates attributed to this quote, Jess, and that's we overestimate what we can achieve in one year, but we underestimate what we can achieve in 10 years, nearly always, yeah. every yeah. life. So, I mean, it's very exciting, your future. And then that 5,000 metre record, which had held, been, you know, Benita Willis is for 18 years and anyone that knows Benita knows she's just, 
uh, a national treasure like, you know, now like yourself who's just down to earth, just does a business, doesn't make a big deal of it, and, uh, and you clocked 14 minutes, 43.80. Uh, I imagine, knowing Benita, that uh, there were some words of encouragement that came from Benita your way after that. Yeah, there was um, actually after the 5K and after the 3K because that was also her record. But it was incredible to It's kind of like you get a little starstruck when you receive a message from them um, still. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, she was awesome and she was pretty quick to sort of say, like, it's just the start as well. So, um, yeah, it was really nice to have her encouragement. And even, like, prior to the 3K, I think she also sent me a good luck message. So, like, it's it's really nice to know that um, it. I might now hold the record. She still holds way more records than I can imagine just yet, but um, she was in support of what I was doing this summer. So it's a pretty cool feeling. And I think all of Australia in distance running, uh, we, I think we all sense that there's this really golden streak that we're experiencing with yourself mm-hmm. and the likes of your teammate, Stewie Mack, who also obviously took out three records uh, across those months as well, those weeks, well, that week uh, as well. So uh, it's exciting times. Jess, uh, just thinking back to your origins, uh, and we do want to talk about the other origin, Oregon. It's a bad, <laughs> bad dad joke. I had to get it somewhere. But That's a good when, one. <laughs> when did Jess Hull first know that, uh, or just when did you first sense that you had a, a, a running gift? How old were you? Can you remember the moment? Yeah, I think uh, I was probably around eight or nine. Um, we did our school cross country carnival, and I just, I just ran. I didn't really know, like I had no idea what a race plan was. I just was like, I'm having fun. Um, so I just ran. It was like a two k race at just across at our local showground um, from school, and yeah, I just ran that, and um, I was able to win that, and it was kind of like, oh wow, this is fun. Um, and <laughs> then I just, uh, yeah, I went to, I only went to the district level that next year. I didn't qualify to region or state or anything but I I kind of got a bit hooked and um really enjoyed it and I would start running with my dad basically just 10 to 15 minutes a day um very small uh but he would take me at the start of his run and then just like drop me back and keep running um and then I joined Albion Park Little Athletics Club that October and I was set from there basically I was racing the boys in the 700 meter pack start and then um eventually the 800 the following year when we were old enough to do like real distances um but yeah i think that kind of kick-started the enjoyment for it was uh being at little athletics and the friends that you have when you're that age at little a's and um running around trying all the different events and thinking that maybe I was going to be a triple jumper or a hurdler, but <laughs> I've left those days behind me. <laughs> triple jumper or a hurdler. Uh, and here we are with uh, the 1,500, 3,000 and 5,000 metre national records in your, uh, in your bag. So does that mean your genes come from your father? Yeah, they come from dad. He was a <laughs> runner. Um, he was a runner himself kind of through till about 14 or 15. And then he went over and played um, football more competitively. What sort of football? Uh, rugby league. He played for the Steelers, local, um, not the Dragons, but Illawarra Steelers at the time. Yeah. As in first grade, the the, the premiership team, the team. Yeah. 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 Wow. <laughs> so there are some uh, real sporting genes, and uh, and Jess, keeping it fun. I mean, that seems to be a theme that prior featured performers have shared through their developmental years, uh, whether it's Nick Willis in New Zealand or um, Jemima Montag through Little A's, and that's just, you know, having fun kept them in the sport. So mm-hmm. is that something that you'd encourage parents of children or junior athletes to really keep a focus on, just keep it fun? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Is Keeping it fun is the best thing you can possibly do. Uh, it's the It keeps you kid interested they're going to want to keep coming back if they're enjoying it and um at the end of the day I think from a very young age athletes are their own hardest critic so they don't need to be told what was good and what was bad um they just need to be told to enjoy the process and enjoy the moment kind of thing um if they don't quite meet their parents expectations um I don't really think parents should have expectations on young kids but um it's definitely not something that they need as an external pressure at that age um they're just out there having fun and making friends. And I think that's what's going to keep them in the sport the longest time. Absolutely. Were there any other sports that you dabbled in through your developmental years, Jess? Or was it little A's when you were hooked and, uh, and that was it? 
<laughs> yeah, no, I did play soccer as well for a couple of years. Um, I think that was uh, that was actually came from dad. Uh, he did coach me for running at the time, but he kind of thought it was very important that I also have a team sport and um, learn to kind of play as a team and uh, all that. And I, I think now that that was also at the time, it kept training really fun because I could then go to soccer training and I had all these young girls my age and we were just having fun and not winning many games but we were (laughs) were having a good laugh and um, I think that possibly laid the foundation for being able to find a team environment in track and field and that was when I went over to the University of Oregon I was really able to buy into that. And uh, and I'm just thinking as the, the physio inside me that your, your father really did you a great favour in getting you involved in soccer from that multi-directional load in bone density yeah. developmental pathway. Well done, Dad. <laughs> the, the University of Oregon, uh, Lily Burden, Gold Coast based, uh, if not US based, uh, middle distance runner who's worked on the show in the past uh, with some social media behind the scenes. Uh, Lily. Uh, was very excited about your national records. And speaking <laughs> off air, you touched on some of the fun times in training have been with Lily, who was also a fellow University of Oregon duck. Uh, can you put a little bit of a, a sense of uh, understanding for, for those in Australia who this show is international, but I think we hear about the US college system and, you know, uh, we don't always understand how it functions. So what was the experience like that you had as a, as a duck, a university of Oregon duck? I believe it was very positive. Yeah. My experience was extremely positive. Um, I think that was from just ne- like landing in a situation where I was always surrounded by people that had my best interest at heart and didn't see me as a workhorse. They see me as a person and a student and an athlete. Um, and that relationship really flowed from there. And so I was lucky coming in. I had, um, I came in as the only freshman my year and then Lily joined us in the January. So I had about three months there where the team was quite a little bit older than me, but they were teaching me so much every day. And um, I had women who had come off finishing fourth and fifth at the NCAA, um, were coming off a podium result in cross country, and then they finished second as well that year. So um, I just had really good people to look up to and settle in. And um, it's definitely an adjustment being away from home. But kind of from the start, I had a, a good relationship with my teammates and I, I built a really solid relationship with my coach, Marisa, over there. And um, she was also not just a coach, but like a mother figure away from home and just like really like I knew how much she cared about me as a person that what I did on the track um, came second to all of that. And I think that was the the big key to feeling so comfortable away from home was just knowing that I was supported and um, having teammates and coaching staff that were like that really set set the way for my experience over there. And it's so great to hear because it's really the foundational stepping stone between juniors and a successful senior career or, you know, unfortunately often sometimes out of the sport, you know, or a, mm-hmm. a fading light. Uh, it was a multidisciplinary team, I believe. You had dietetic yeah. input, I believe strength and conditioning input, all with some uh, therapies, all with some, uh, you know, top of the field Uh, individuals yeah yeah you have access to pretty much everything you do as a professional athlete and you also go to school so um your days are pretty busy but yeah you have everything at your fingertips and every resource you could possibly need to kind of make it work on the track and um, if you buy into it and you you give it your all as much as they're giving back to you um you're gonna go a long way yeah no brilliant and when was the decision made was it even a a contemplative moment of going professional versus going on to study or running recreation. In your mind, it was always a one path. I'm taking this as far as I can. Yeah, I definitely um, wanted to see how far I could take this. I didn't want to ever kind of sit back and think, what if down the track? Um, I would, don't know if I would have regretted if I didn't give it a good go, that's for sure. Um, but I think it was also just like good identification from from dad really at the time was that if I was to stay here, um, it was going to be really hard to transition those years. Um, I wasn't really old enough or strong enough or fit enough or fast enough to make teams yet. Um, and there's nothing really in the medium intermediately between that age of 18, 19 and 22, 23 being competitive to make teams again. Um, I think he kind of seen it as a, a really good opportunity for me to go and still be competitive with people around my ability and continue to learn how to race and learn how to train and see what that was all about over there. And 
I certainly got that experience in the in the racing over there that I don't know that I would have had back here just because there is such a gap. Like uh, the younger girls that are running well are, are too young, um, but then the open women who are making these teams are are too much better than where I was at that point in time. So I would have kind of been in no man's land in a lot of those uh, racing situations and you don't learn from that situation kind of racing against yourself within a race. Um, so going over there and learning how to be competitive and in training um, and in racing was, was definitely the, the best thing we could have done. I mean, the American, oh, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, otherwise, uh, tip to uh, hat nod to dad. Uh, yeah. The American <laughs> scene, just with the sheer size of the population, the colleges, the investment, you know, through the colleges, it's a, it serves, in your case, as a great platform and many others. Jess, uh, before we throw into a performance round, a rapid fire series of performance related questions, uh, a, a couple of learnings uh, that I think are interesting. I heard you reference this concept that I think. Pete and yourself must must discuss, and that's the difference between training age and chronological age. Uh, mm-hmm. Can you touch a little bit around your understanding of that and, and why that matters in performance? It definitely influences performance because it has an effect on your durability as well. Um, but I think what we've looked at is like uh, we we have both on our side. Like I'm young and I'm not overtrained. Um, I've been running for a long time, but all my coaches have been very gradual. So I'm not at a training age that advances my years or anything um, to the point where we just don't need to get greedy. We just need to take each week, each month kind of as they come versus being like, okay, in next week we're going to attempt this workout and I don't care if you can do it or if you can't. Um, We're just really gradual and incremental approaches to it. And I think that's um, the key to long-term success is just consistency over time versus um, repeated injuries that keep you out for too long that might even misalign that training age and that chronological age in the opposite direction. Um, so yeah, we, mine match up pretty well because I've had good people around me all the time. (laughs) So so it's a matter of trying to keep your training age in match with your chronological age, uh, by not, if you like losing time due to a boom bust injury cycle, which is just so, so wise. It's taking that longer term approach, as you say, don't get greedy uh, yeah. <laughs> sounds simple to do, but it can be extremely difficult to execute. Exactly. Even um, like I see some of the things that Shannon's able to do and I'm like, oh, please let me try that. And we're just like, we're not overreaching that just yet. Um, I've got plenty of time to get to those points. Yeah. Wow. So <laughs> wise. Jess, uh, you mentioned trying to avoid injuries. Have there been any injuries thus far that you've had to navigate? Yeah. So my first year over at Oregon, I had a little stress fracture in my third metatarsal um and that was kind of the first real like uh thing that kept me out of running um that I'd ever had and it was definitely a process to build back um I think I kind of underestimated how hard it would be um I think that was a little bit of naivety at my age like I was only 19 I'd just moved over there um I don't think I really had a, a good grasp on injury recovery but I've been pretty lucky ever since in that I, it's never bothered me and um I've only really had a little calf strain that came out of nowhere um I ran a 5k for the first time um when I was still at Oregon and uh I got a little calf strain out of that which I think that one was pretty testing mentally because it was more of the timing of it was it was the start of April it was the start of outdoor um I'd won the 1500 title the year before and I was really wanting to defend my title. And I just felt like it was like, in, the, in reality, I was only out for about two weeks, but it just felt like I was like working against a brick wall, <laughs> trying to get that fitness and get the work in that I knew I needed to be able to, to contend in June. Um, and in reality, I was probably being a little bit um, overdramatic about it and it, it healed pretty quick and I, I didn't really lose much time at all. But um, in the moment, it just felt like it was a, uh, kind of a, a bit too much going on, but um, I've been lucky ever since that. I've been, been pretty healthy. That's a, a, a fantastic track record and not a nice way to make a 5K or 5,000 metre debut, pulling up a, a calf strain. Hello, welcome. I know, <laughs> yeah. I was pretty nervous when um, last year when Pete, because uh, so this is about six months later, my last race before Doha um, was a 5K in Berlin. And when Pete posed that to me, I was like, uh, last 5K I did, I was uh, out of action for two weeks. And I don't know that we want that right before Doha. Um, but he was pretty confident that that was just a, a random one-off thing that um, had accumulated from 
training on different surfaces, being at camp and then going to race, um, probably all kind of contributed to that, not the 5K itself. <laughs> I've um, had better positive experiences since then, thank goodness. <laughs> absolutely, like a 14, uh, was it 1443.80 national record? Uh, that's a positive experience. Uh, yeah. That was, that was your, oh no, that was Benita's or that was yours? That was yours. That was, that was yeah. what I ran, yeah. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> just uh, looking at my notes. Jess, uh, strength and conditioning, what what does that look like for you? What role does it play for you? Yeah, so we do quite a bit in the gym um, for distance runners uh, overall, I would guess. Um, I think the trend is now to see a, a little bit more focus on strength and conditioning in distance runners as well. Um, but, yeah, we do two heavy lifts a week after our hard workouts, so our our hard days are hard. Um, and prior to joining Pete in July last year, I hadn't done any sort of like lifting, lifting. Um, we'd done some, uh, gym work with uh, coach Brad at the university of Oregon, but never, I hadn't lifted anything heavy. Like I'd only use the bar. Um, I'd never done a deadlift. I'd never done a, a squat with like any weight on the bar or anything. So, um, that was quite a change over the last 12 months. And, um, it's cool cause you, you feel yourself with the contact with the ground, like really improving. Um, so that, uh, we sort of, we don't do too much heavy stuff, usually just one or two exercises at the end of our lift. Um, but we do a lot of like intrinsic hip exercises with resistance bands, um, single leg exercises with just some dumbbells, um, and a big focus on core work, um, has kind of kicked in this year itself. Um, back since about January, we've had a new core routine and, um, it doesn't get any easier. <laughs> Uh, as a sports physio, that's just music to my ears and obviously you'd be surrounded by the best programming. But uh, uh, what gap do you have between your hard sessions running and then the, and then the lifting in the, in the S&C sessions? Is there a, what, how many hours? Yeah. So uh, ideally you kind of go from the track into the gym, um, but COVID this year has kind of changed that a little bit. So I know my team in the US were lifting kind of on a um, – one-on-one basis not in a group setting so it would have just been a like maybe there'd be an hour or a couple of hours between your session in the morning before you got in the gym based on the program um but here so I try and piggyback them um unless I'm really tired like if the workouts really knocked me around um I'll go home have some lunch put my feet up for a little bit and then go to the gym in the afternoon and pair it with my double run kind of thing. So um, might jog a bit beforehand just to loosen up and then go in the gym. In the gym. I kind of just make that call based on how my body feels after the hard session. But we always get the hard session done in the morning. So um, that way you can play around a bit with whether you lift straight afterwards or later on in the day. And uh, it's all around that premise of making the hard day hard. Yeah, yeah. And then um, easy day, easy. But uh, we still do a little bit of um, a lot of mobility and a lot of um, core work kind of still on those easier days um, just to keep things moving. I find my body feels better when it does like keep the load pretty steady versus like up and down, up and down for the week. Um, so I'll only lift heavy stuff on those two workout days, but um, I'll do a little bit of core and mobility work on the other days. Yeah, absolutely. And then in training inclusions, uh, Jess, before we throw into the performance round, rapid fire questions, uh, in a training cycle, you know, leading into one of these national record perform, I mean, obviously it was a bit odd because they were so close together, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, in a, in a key training phase, what sort of just headlines, what sort of key sessions do, does Pete like to see you doing? You know, obviously you've got your track workouts. Yeah. So kind of um, over a 10 day period, I'll hit three different training zones um with a long run in there as well so um i'll long run every every sunday that's kind of standard um but the four track session four sessions that would fall in that two-week period will be cycled between um a speed-based workout so that'll be shorter reps um sometimes it's shorter rest shorter reps um other times depending how fast we're trying to go it might be short reps but longer rest um and trying to really keep that intensity up um, so short reps and then, um, like a 5k based track workout that 3k, 5k based, um, and then a tempo run. So this year being at home, I actually have like a really good cross country course right near my house. Um, so I've been doing my tempos on there versus doing them on the track. Um, 
So I'd never done a track tempo until I joined Pete last year. And I, I was like surprised at how they're not actually as bad as they kind of <laughs> sound. Um, you kind of think it's going to be really long, but um, they're actually not too bad. Uh, but this year being able to get on the cross country course for those, um, I think has really built some really good strength uh, in like my calves and everything. Um, and it also just saves your body a little bit, but um, cause the course rolls up and down a bit and it's grass, it's uh it's been good, I think, for building extra strength. Yeah, and no, absolutely. Uh, and all off it's at a two-week training cycle. Yeah, so we'll repeat one of those kinds of sessions because you'll get in a two-week cycle, you get four workouts in. Um, so it might be that one, we get two speed workouts in like 10 days apart or we get two tempo runs in 10 days apart. It just depends on um, where we're at with what we need. Yeah, it's great to hear from a, you know, a peak performer around the fact that training cycles don't have to be seven days. I think it's often a recreational, you know, uh, framework that people adopt that it's got to all fit into seven days, but in some ways it's almost almost impossible to allow that recovery between, uh, between those key workouts. You're listening to Jessica Hull sharing on her career highs, lows and learnings. Support for today's show comes from Endure IQ. Whether you're an athlete or coach, Endure IQ aims to empower you with the knowledge, tools, and strategies to optimize your sports performance. Founded by Dr. Dan Plews, who you may remember from episode 213, heat training and acclimation for the endurance athlete and expert edition. Endure IQ brings you online courses in the practical application of low carbohydrate, high fat, training fundamentals, and heat strategies. To get you started, Endure IQ will gift you $25 US towards your first Endure IQ purchase. Use the coupon BRADBEER, capital B-R-A-D-B-E-R, at the checkout. Information is useful, but knowing how to use it is powerful. Endure IQ, hitting the sweet spot of performance, health and enjoyment. Visit EndureIQ.com. Support for today's show also comes from the Physical Performance Show's Learnings Membership, where from just $5 US per month, you can support the production of the show and in return, receive complimentary access to all upcoming live stream events. In 2020, we held live stream events with former featured experts of the show, Dr. Stephen Seiler and Dr. Shona Halson, that were widely attended worldwide from coaches, athletes, through to practitioners. To support the show, jump over to Patreon and search The Physical Performance Show and become a patron of the show today. And lastly, support for today's show also comes from Pogo Physio's online telehealth consultations. If you're an endurance athlete struggling with bone, tendon or joint related concerns, our online consultations with myself or any of the Pogo Physio team are a convenient and effective way to get back to your physical best. To schedule your online telehealth consultation, jump over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash telehealth. For now, let's jump back with this week's featured performer, Australian distance running star, national record holder, 1,500 metres, 3,000 metres and 5,000 metres, Jessica Hull. Jess, are you ready for the physical performance round? (laughs) I think so. (laughs) Here we go. Training session most disliked. So when I first joined Pete, um, it was the 8800s, but I've learned to love that one because it does pop up a bit and it is a staple. Um, so I had to reframe that and uh, kind of be ready to embrace that one instead. Um, so I think my least favorite one, if I'm solo, my least favorite work to do is speed work. So 200s, 300s. I just bet when you're on your own, they're very, very hard um, when you're trying to do them fast. So, yeah, I think uh, I would much rather see kind of a 3K, 5K workout in the program than a bunch of 200s at the moment. <laughs> hard to generate that extra uh, <laughs> propulsive force when there's no one on your shoulder. Training exactly. session training session most loved? Um, most loved would be probably 400, 300, 200 repeats. So, sets of that um it's been my favorite for a long time um even back in college Maurice used to give us that one um even sometimes we do like something longer at the start and then come back and end with that 400 300 200 breakdown um it's just always been one I've really really loved so and are they like walk back (laughs) walk recoveries or jog or what sort of recovery Uh, it's usually next rep jog so after the 400 you jog 300 and then do the three yeah 
Yeah, makes sense. Favorite pre-race meal, Jess? What what fueled you to these three national records? Yeah, so I figured this one out over time, but um, I just I go to oatmeal no matter what time of day it is. So porridge, I guess, back here in Australia. Um, yeah, no matter what time of the day I'm racing, night, um, morning, my last meal is always porridge with uh, banana, peanut butter. Um, some chia seeds and yeah, lots of good things. It <laughs> uh, sounds like the uh, the plan. Bedtime, morning time, Jess. Is that quite disciplined? Um, yeah, yeah. So I try and just make sure I'm not necessarily disciplined about the specific timing of things. Um, more just like I really try and make sure I'm going to have the opportunity to get eight to nine hours of sleep. I like to know that if I've got to get up at seven a.m. the next morning, that means I really need to be trying to be asleep by like eleven at the latest to have that maximal sleep yeah wise athlete jess tough question <laughs> who's the athlete you most admire and why well it's probably a little biased just because she's my training partner but i think really shannon um just definitely i've always kind of looked up to her career for a long time um i remember watching her in the diamond leagues when i was like 14 or 15 and you could kind of enter the diamond league tipping competition of who was going to win each race um watching shannon and jenny race against the kenyan women um kind of has always been an inspiration and then now kind of knowing Shannon more personally and having her share her experiences with me and sharing this last summer with her. I just, she's an all round incredible athlete. So I, I could only hope to model the longevity and the results that she's had. Uh, brilliant. Toughest competitor you've ever raced, Jess. Who's that and why? Yeah. So I think um, this summer was definitely Laura Waitman. Um, she is just like, She's so strong um, and she's obviously in incredible shape. So uh, I think it's always a, and um, Ellie Puria as well for this same reason is that um, you can run with them and you can race with them, but making a pass on them is impossible. So I had that experience kind of with Ellie back in the NCAA in 2018. Um, I tried to go by her with 300 to go and there was no possibility that I was going to. And then um, same thing at 200 to go was I just couldn't for the life of me get by her. And um, same thing in a couple of races this year with Laura Waitman. I had the chance to go by um, in Berlin in the 1500, but couldn't make the pass whatsoever. So I think um, that's pretty incredibly inspiring how strong they are holding their own out there. Give it a few seasons and they may be uh, answering that question uh, with Jessica <laughs> Hull on their lips. Is there a mantra that you use when you're racing, Jess, or training? Some regular self-talk. Yeah, so my go-to at the moment has been keeping my head where my feet are. So rather than kind of thinking too far ahead, um, just keeping exactly where I am. Um, and that works in racing and in training. And um, it also, also helped me kind of focus in the 5K and Monaco of like uh, – I had a race plan that was breaking down into kind of the two miles and then to getting to 800 to go. So that, um, what is that? That's another K or so. And I just kind of kept reminding myself what I had to do in those specific parts. So keeping my head in that first two miles and I just had to stay relaxed and stay focused. And then I just had to stay connected and, uh, yeah, just staying in the moment is the, the key to getting through those hard times. But that's such a memorable little statement, keep your head where your feet are versus sort of yeah. quite cliched, stay in the moment. I think it sticks. Yeah. Like memorable. Keep your head where your feet are. I think I'm going to adopt that too, Jess. <laughs> yeah, Jess. I'm giving away all my secrets. <laughs> yeah. uh, look, uh, you're not giving away your athletic talent though, so you'll be okay. Uh, your best recovery tip, Jess? <laughs> um refueling definitely refueling and have fun with refueling um mix up the menu all those kinds of things get a variety um and then just uh good massages and being like pretty diligent about staying in front of things if something hurts um speak up about it before it becomes an issue right. no, nothing's ever too soon to kind of to start thinking about mm, once again such a wise approach and, and i did hear you reference it through your years at uh, the University of Oregon, you were educated around fueling for sessions and fueling mm -hmm. post sessions. And I think I did hear you say that you were taught how to fuel for these hard sessions. And I think as athletes, even practitioners, uh, coaching team, we don't always think about having an athlete fuel for the work they're about to do. We often talk about recovery on the other side, but any tips yeah. you'd share as a side note on the performance round around how to fuel for the hard sessions? 
Yeah, just kind of planning out ahead of time. Um, so if you know, so sometimes we turn up to the track and we don't know what our workouts are, um, but we know that Tuesdays and Fridays are work days. They're hard days. So that means you start preparing for them on Monday, um, dinner on Monday. Everything starts to be a bit more amped towards getting the most out of yourself on Tuesday. Uh, so just kind of increasing carbs and all that kind of thing to make sure that you're ready on the day. And then immediately after, I'm pretty, like, I'm very disciplined about this is I get the protein straight in. Um, and something else I've found that has helped even more with my recovery is uh, getting in a carb source with that protein. So most whey proteins are, and well, um, depends on it, vegan or based or whatever, um, but most whey proteins are just protein. So being able to also get in an apple or a piece of fruit makes a big difference in replenishing that glycogen. So I definitely feel better in my afternoon double if I start that sooner versus if I kind of don't have that um, carbohydrate snack as well, the double will feel a bit sluggish. And if you think about that in the scheme of things, how much um, you already feel tired like four or five hours later when you're trying to double, you've really slowed your recovery down. So yeah, just focus on being ready for the day and speeding up the recovery afterwards with good, healthy food. Yeah, thinking ahead, feeling for the work required. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, back on these rapid fire questions. One word to describe your racing style, Jess? Ooh, um, aggressive, I would say. <laughs> and it's such a juxtaposition to the uh, to the you know the mildly mannered you know Jess Hull uh, of everyday life. Where does that aggression come from? <laughs> Uh, I think I've just always wanted to, I think I touched on this before, but I never want to wonder what if. Um, so I think I would rather put myself way in it and blow up a little bit um, and know that I'm going to put more and more pieces together every time and um, sit back and kind of think, oh, if only I had gone with that pack or this person, um, what could I have done? Yeah, yeah. no and, regrets. <laughs> and, and watching you race and perform, you know, the word I'd use is just gutsy. You just seem to get after it. You know, you seem like you've left everything there on the track, which is just inspiring no matter what the position, no matter what the time. So keep going. How would you describe being in the zone, Jess? Ooh, being in the zone just feels like a, um, like you just feel ready. I think that's my cue is if I feel ready, um, I know I'm in the zone. And that kind of comes from training, but also just like, feeling fresh on race day and knowing that I've done everything I can to be ready on that day. Um, it's, the, it's a really good feeling to, to feel ready. <laughs> feeling ready. When was the last time you were in the zone? I would say probably the 1500 in Berlin was my like peak in the zone um, moment. And I just felt so ready. I knew I'd done all the work. I felt great. The taper felt great. Um, but we kind of used that as our, our championship race for the year. So I felt really good by the time um, we rode around to race day there and I, I just felt ready like I felt good warming up I felt quick off the ground I was like okay I'm, I'm ready to do this <laughs> uh, the, the current featured performer Jess uh, Miles Stewart former world champion triathlete and uh, CEO of Triathlon Australia he he described the zone so interestingly he said when you're in the zone it's easy it's when you're out of the zone that's when you're, you're, yeah. you're feeling it yeah <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that comes down to your process. Like if you know you've done everything, you're going to feel in the zone. If you think, if you look back and you're like, oh, I should have done this a bit differently. I should have been a bit more focused here. I think that's when you're starting to doubt yourself and that's going to make it hard to be in the zone. So just being consistent and doing all the boxes right. Uh, brilliant. Final question <laughs> in the performance round, Jess. The hardest session you've ever done. Can you recall one that stands out amongst the many? Yeah, um, so I did this session twice and both times it's been very challenging. First time I did it in Phoenix with the male pay start and with Coco, um, 500, 400, 300 times three. Um, and you kind of, everything is faster than 1500 meter pace. Um, so starting around 63 second pace and just getting quicker. Um, by the third 400, I was paddling, but I was still running a, a PB for the 400 um, and then uh, Pete actually just made the executive decision that I only needed to run a 200 at the end. I didn't need to try and run a 300. Um, so yeah, he kind of uh, adjusted as we went and then I repeated that session on the grass back here um, oh, probably in early June and it did not go very well. I was solo and it was just like, it was a 
it was a grind. So uh, I'm yet to master that one. <laughs> I think it's comforting to hear that some sessions, uh, even for the likes of Jess Hull, can be a grind. And uh, yep. <laughs> I think it's worth putting the caveat on that, that these epic sessions don't make champions, but the, the consistent you know, sessions back to back over time do, which you've already yeah. touched on. Jess, Tough question. You're out of the performance round. Well done. You can chalk that up as a training session for the day. But <laughs> career <you>. learnings, <laughs> if you could boil everything you've learnt to date, which you're fresh in years, you've got such a runway ahead of you, really with your whole career still to come. But if you could boil what you've learnt today into one piece of advice, Jess, to help listeners of this show perform at their best, what would Jessica Hull's single piece of advice be? Definitely just really enjoy the moment and appreciate um, results as they come. Don't ever, don't look too far ahead. Don't be like, okay, what's next? Um, take a moment to sit in what you've done. Um, and I think a piece that goes with that is don't let the highs get too high and don't let the lows get too low. Just kind of stay very consistent. Um, you don't, one good workout doesn't make you ready to race and one bad workout doesn't mean that you're not ready to race. Um, same as one good race doesn't mean that you've had a good season and one bad race doesn't mean it's a bad season. Just kind of enjoying the highs and appreciating them for what they are, learning from the lows but never getting too high or too low. Just stay nice and even. Wow. And uh, I think anyone listening in today will appreciate the sense of groundedness you do have. But it is easy to lose your mind, isn't it, when there's just a session that doesn't go to plan and all of a sudden all the confidence yeah. <laughs> seems to drain out of your body and it's like, hold on, look at this on paper. It's one yeah. session out of 39 that hasn't gone well or whatever the number may be. Yeah. My last session before I went over to Europe this year was not really good. <laughs> um, and I was like, I actually have a trend of doing that is my last session before I traveled to race. Um, isn't usually that good. And I don't know what that is and whether I've just been a bit busy kind of uh, organizing myself to travel and all of that. Um, so I kind of, this year was the first time I didn't read anything into it. I was just like, okay, this is normal. <laughs> and then um, I'll freshen up and I'll be ready to go. And then seven days later, I ran 14.43. So you just, uh, you just go take it as it comes sometimes. <laughs> and, and I mean, talking about it, it seems so commonsensical that of course, there's multiple factors that can affect performance, life loads, you know, psychological yep. loads, getting ready to travel amongst a pandemic. Yeah. Um, you know, yep. <laughs> so we're, we're, you know, athletes are humans, they're not machines. You're listening to Jessica Hull, a national record holder for the 3,000 metres, 1,500 metres and 5,000 metres on this Featured Performer episode. If you missed last week's episode, it featured another great Australian athlete, Miles Stewart, OAM. Miles currently serves as a CEO of Triathlon Australia, was a 2000 Australian Olympic triathlon representative, Commonwealth Games medalist, and the 1991 World Triathlon Champion at just 20 years of age. Here's a little snippet from Miles' sharings on what has been a very popular featured performer episode. My one piece of advice would be the same for any one of those people would be have the great mentors. Have the great mentors. Absolutely. Um, if you want to learn how to be a world champion, talk to one who's done it before. If you it's, want to learn to be a world champion, talk to If you want to learn how to be a great cha- coach, go and talk to the best coach you can get your hands on. If you want to be a great physio, go and find the best physio and talk to them. Reaching out to mentors and having that guiding person is, is going to save you a lot of trial and error and heartache. But then don't just reach out and listen. You know, no point reaching out to a mentor. And, and mentorship's a two-way street. So you, you've got to give and receive. You can't just take. Mm. So, you know, reach out to people. Um, you'd be surprised how many people are willing to help, but you cut out a lot of mistakes by having the right mentors. To enjoy the full episode, jump over to wherever it is that you enjoy your podcast from, and you can also find the Physical Performance Show streaming on YouTube at your fingertips. For now, let's jump back with this week's Featured Performer, Episode 247, National Record Holder, 1,500 metres, 3,000 metres and 5,000 metres, Jessica Hull. Jess, uh, every guest of the Physical Performance Show issues listeners with a physical challenge for the week. Now, this can be entry Ooh. level or it can be very difficult. I think of uh, Genevieve Lacaz's or Gregson's challenge. I think it's one of the toughest 30 pull-ups or 20 it might have been, she said. I think it was 20. I think she just cracked 20. And uh, yeah. I think that was one of the hardest ones I've had over the, over the four or five years. But what's Jessica Hull's physical challenge to listeners of the show going to be? Okay, well, so for a running one, I would say go and do 10 times 200 meter hill sprints. 
just jug back down. Um, but also from a, if we're looking at something like Jen's challenge, um, I would say turn a BOSU ball upside down so that the ball side is on the ground and you can balance on the flat side. Um, stand on it on one leg and try and do 10 uh, single leg deadlifts or runner's touches, whatever you say. So um, single leg, stand on one leg and then kick the other leg back and also fold your torso forward from the hips and um, kind of come back into a perfect running position afterwards. So, uh, <laughs> so we've got the 10 by 200 meter hill sprint jog back down for recovery and we've got the BOSU ball single leg runners touches times 10 challenge from Jessica Hull. So it's a double. Yeah. <laughs> yeah if you can do both on the same day, you've uh, had a pretty hard day. <laughs> and we need uh, evidence of this uh, on videos, photos, social media, tag Jess in so she can see. And yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> absolutely. Jess, uh, final few questions. What would you say the top three characteristics for performance? If you could boil it down to a little recipe of the three things that people need to perform at their best. I know you've given your one piece of advice there, which was so great, but what do you reckon are the top three characteristics or in your case, what makes you so good? I hope I have these characteristics. Um, But yeah, I would say resiliency, uh, confidence in just your ability to execute, uh, which you get from training, but you also need to be like you have to believe in yourself. Um, so I'd say that falls under confidence and positivity is you need to be able to see the upside or the optimistic side of things. You can't get bogged down in the negatives. So yeah, resiliency, optimism, positivity, and uh, confidence. And do you feel like they can all be learned or they're innate? Yeah, that's interesting. I think um, I would say... It depends on who you're surrounded by. I think uh, you can definitely learn a lot of those traits from the people around you, Um, but you could also be naturally a pretty positive person or a confident person. But um, I'd say surround yourself with people that make those traits stronger. Um, Resiliency, definitely, I think I learned from my coach at Oregon, Marisa. She was uh, pretty big on us being resilient humans and um, controlling what we could control and just... uh, the only thing that mattered was our attitude and our effort. And if the day was going bad and we were still positive and we were still putting in the effort, um, we were going to come out more resilient women. Yeah. Wow. What a, uh, what a wise coach, wise athlete as well. Yeah. You had <laughs> seem, seemingly very wise people around you through your whole development. Uh, very much so. <laughs> Jess, looking ahead, Tokyo 2021, seems like it it's so likely to go ahead, uh, yeah. talk about resiliency and going from having qualified for the 5,000 metres as Australian champion uh, earlier in 2020, uh, then also looking ahead to the 1,500 metres. But there's the, uh, the scheduling challenge, which I've heard you reference mm-hmm. with the, the Olympics. And, you know, the decision around that, you, you seem to have placed wholly and solely at the feet of your coach, Pete, and which yeah. one you run. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I trust him to have me ready for which other one he thinks I have the best opportunity for um, being 24 next year and at the Olympic Games for the first time. So I think uh, his experience is way above mine here. So uh, whatever he thinks is going to be the best that I'm suited towards, I'll be ready to do that. Yeah, for your Olympic debut, what a way to make a debut. And, uh, and Jess, for those that do want to and those that aren't yet following your journey, where can we follow along? Obviously, uh, over on social. Yeah, so mainly on Instagram, I'm Jessica with two A's, Hull, H-U-L-L. And I'm also on Twitter at Jessica Hull 143 But I would say Instagram is the place where I'm the most active and uh, the best at being able to, to kind of follow along with other people's journeys as well. Yeah, and there's some great posts that you do post up. So do jump over and follow along. And a bit of a fun one here. Finally, Jess, finish the sentence. The most important thing in life is? Having fun. Oh, gosh. (laughs) Can can we end on a higher note? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Jess, you're you're a national treasurer already, national record holder three times over. Uh, young in years with such a future and a wise head on your shoulders. So thanks for stopping by the Physical Performance Show, touching on some of your career highs, lows and and the many learnings. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. This was really fun. It's good to kind of take it from a different angle. I like Uh, this. uh, Jess, thank you and all the best. Thank you. Good luck with your challenges, everybody. (laughs) Yeah, post them up. So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show, and I trust you enjoyed Jess's share-ins there, her highs, lows, 
and the learnings she's accrued to date. What a wise and so capable athlete. Australian distance running really is in for a treat in the years ahead. Couple Jess's performances with prior featured performer of the show, Stuart McSwain, who likewise set three national records across the same time frame whilst competing at the Diamond League Athletics event himself. And if you missed Stuart McSwain's featured performer episode, be sure to jump over to episode 152. Be sure to give Jessica a follow over on Instagram at Jessica A Hull H U L L. You can find all links and YouTube footage of Jessica's fantastic national records over on the show notes page at pogophysio.com.au. And if you take on the physical challenge for the week, the BOSU Balance Challenge or the 10 by 200 meter hill repeats, do tag the show in on social media at Physical Performance Show on Instagram and tag Jess in as well. As always, a massive thank you to those leaving ratings and reviews for the show over on iTunes, for those hitting subscribe, and now for those supporting the Physical Performance Show over on Patreon with our five US dollar a month learnings membership. Many times over the last several years, we've been asked how people can support the show and Patreon makes it so easy to do just that. In return for the Physical Performance Show's patrons, we'll give you access to the live stream recordings with our featured experts, including Dr. Stephen Seiler and Dr. Shona Halson. We're set for some great live stream events into 2021. And a big shout out to this week's new patron, Kemi Thompson-Graves. Kemi, thank you for your support of the show. A massive thanks also for the great folk who make this show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin on all things show administration, and Matthew Walding on all things show graphic design. And a huge thank you to this week's show sponsor, Endure IQ. If you are a long course triathlete or endurance athlete looking for upskilling with your knowledge and skills around race fueling, training fueling, heat strategies, and more, be sure to take advantage of Endure IQ's online $25 discount off any of their great online courses. Jump over to endureiq.com. Dr. Dan Plews, founder of Endure IQ, knows his stuff, both as a practitioner, academic, PhD in exercise physiology, having worked with some of the planet's best athletes and also himself, an incredible endurance athlete, current age group world record holder for the Hawaii Ironman World Triathlon Championships with a blistery in 824 set in 2018. Now, coming up on the Physical Performance Show, we have some treats for you leading into the end of the 2020 calendar year. Of course, we'll be doing our 2020 year in review, best of the expert editions and best of the featured performers. We'll also be sharing with you the top 10 most downloaded episodes. And if you have an episode in particular that you've enjoyed this year, jump over to the Physical Performance Show on Facebook and let us know what has been your most popular moment or episode of the show for the 2020 calendar year. Until next week, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer and this has been the Physical Performance Show.